Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad, The Weird, and The Wild, our monthly episode where we analyze one cinematic figure's filmography and make some intensely debatable picks for each of the four titular categories, good, bad, weird, and you guessed it, wild. My name is Matt Reifschneider, and I am joined by my co-host, possibly from a post-apocalyptic future, or perhaps a glowing pink underwater alien civilization, Sean Kaler. How are you doing today, Sean? Listen, rate, review, and subscribe if you want to live. Oh, oh, we're getting there already. You're, just, <laughs> you're taking. <laughs> you came from the future to take care of business. Mm-hmm. That is what you are doing. I can't prepare for a lot of bad Arnie impressions. I am so excited, and which is so funny because we're not doing Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're actually no, no. talking about. I, I, I'm dare I say it a controversial topic. I think Possibly. he might be a little controversial. He's. Uh, He's definitely fallen out of grace. This is true. This is true. We are talking about my good friend, buddy, Jimmy Cam Cams, or as uh, his non-good friends like to call him, James Cameron. That's who we're talking about today. And before we get started, I you already started talking about the business. Let's talk about the business, Sean. Uh, <laughs> so if you like what you hear today, please check out our Expanding Back catalog wherever you listen to your podcasts on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or our newest avenue, YouTube. Check out our other series, No Franchise Fatigue and Fatigued But Not Forgotten, for all of your weird cinematic analysis needs. So, um, the hardest biography I've ever done. Born August 16th, 1954, James Francis Cameron in Kapuske uh, Singh, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> you should keep all of those in there just so that the audience knows how hard it is to say anything Canadian. <laughs> Jumping kind of straight into his production career, he very famously got his start as a miniature model maker at Corman Studios. Um, Roger Corman, famous for a lot of things, most of them not particularly great, but one of his very, very positive things is always gave anybody a chance. If they were there, Especially when one of his many directors quit, which is exactly what happened with Piranha 2. And from there, Cameron has just made hit after hit after hit. However you may feel about his filmography, there is literally no denying the man's a guaranteed moneymaker. It's kind of weird how much he is. And we'll get into this a little bit, but, you know, and we'll, and, and I'll ask you like we normally do a little bit of how you got into James Cameron, but... You know, like he's pretty much stuck with genre cinema the entire time and yet has uh, outside of essentially one film, uh, which you could even argue is genre cinema to some extent, delivered box office success after box office success. Absolutely. Kind of incredible. And, um, you know, I do, you know, not speaking for your list at all, but in the spirit of us largely being focused on genre cinema, I will tell you straight up Titanic's not on my list, but I am a lover. I actually think it is one of his best films, uh, generally, in a list of best films. So, yeah. Well, just and this for the record. Is, you bring up a good point. His filmography is actually pretty small. Eight films total. He's actually credited as like a lead director on. Uh, he disavows one of them, uh, which is Piranha 2, The Spawning. Uh, refuses to talk about that movie whatsoever. Basically says he uh, and it's it. a It's not his movie. And it's a fairly good guess that we're probably going to ignore his uh, two major documentaries, which. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then. But I, I, I think that's a good point to bring up Titanic because. uh Weirdly enough, Titanic's not on my list either. So, but it is kind of the one genre, the one film that's not necessarily fully genre cinema, but you could even make an argument that it kind of is. It's definitely a disaster film. It certainly is, and it's still got all of his tropes, not the least of which being Bill Paxton. Bill, pa- Bill Paxton. I love me some Bill Paxton. R.I.P., by the way. Right, yes, rest in peace, Bill Paxton. We should do a Good, Bad, Weird, Wild on Bill Paxton. Oh, we absolutely times. should. I, I just want to talk about frailty, let's be honest. It's uh, fantastic. So movie. good. So oh. good. So, but I also think that what kind of defines James Cam, James James Cam, Jimmy Cam Cam's career <laughs> is that, um, you know, his weird focus on technological advances in the industry. 
he's got this weird obsession with that, which can be both good and bad. Um, which and, is uh, interesting juxtaposition on his technophobic plot lines. Yeah, oftentimes. Yeah, he's a very strange guy for that. And, you know, I do want to mention there's one thing before we get into our list that I would like to mention is that um, I am a, kind of a huge fan of of uh, his last film which wasn't his movie, which was, uh, you know, Alita Battle Angel. And he, it's obvious his fingerprints are all over that movie, um, but it's interesting to combine with Robert Rodriguez because I think let it's me, a fun combination. Let me just put it this way. Longtime listeners of this show will eventually hear Alita come back up. Yeah. I absolutely promise you. Oh my God. If you fucking pick this for one of our fatigued, but not forgotten episodes, I'm going to be pissed because I absolutely want to see a sequel to this. And I do not think I could argue. It'll be the shortest episode ever. You'll be like, uh, today I'm going to pitch a sequel to Alita battle angel. And I'll just be like, yes, give him all the money, all of the money. Just give it to him. I want yeah. to see a sequel. Me too. How do you drop a surprise Ed Norton cameo at the end of the movie and then never follow it up? Uh, because your name is Disney. That's, that's yeah. how. Ain't that the truth? Because Fox would have taken a chance. I could see Fox being like, you know what? I'm like, we'll take a chance with that. But uh, Disney, uh, <laughs> they're a little bit too business savvy to, to take a chance on something like that. But um, they're, nonetheless, they're, they're risk averse on stuff like that, and yet they will push the Nutcracker and the Seven Kingdoms. It is into four things. realms. That, oh. that they do not have seven. Four. Thank you. <laughs> I, I honest to god the only reason i remember that is because i just watched that movie like two months ago for the first time so um as far as how i got into cameron this is one of those guys um you say this more often than i do but absolute fact in this case i literally can't remember a time in my life where i wasn't watching james cameron movies i i mean i just can't um have early memories of seeing terminator 2 you know um Basically, I think every Cameron movie I've been alive for, I've seen in theaters. Yeah, I'm, I am. I have to be there, probably there, too. I've probably seen all of them in theaters. Um, I have distinct memories of seeing Terminator 2 in theaters. I'm in the same boat. It, James Cameron has been a part of uh, my life as far as I can remember. Um, you know, films like Aliens and Terminator 1 and Terminator 2, uh, a lot of his early stuff, you're damn right. It was just a household item. Um, you know, our family was uh, raised on James Cameron movies. And I think that's a testament to his ability as a director. Now, I did mention before, I do think he's a little bit controversial, partially because I can't stand the guy now. Um, his movies, fantastic. Him, terrible. I cannot. And I, I'm a huge, and I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I'm a huge fan of, of uh, film commentaries. Uh, done by film experts or people who made the movie. I love director's commentaries. I absolutely adore them. James Cameron often makes his films worse with his commentaries. The guy's ego cannot simply fit on an audio track. <laughs> you just Although can't. I will say slightly adjacent since uh, obviously him and Arnie are very good friends. Any commentary track Arnold Schwarzenegger is on, I fully suggest because basically what he's doing is narrating the movie for you as if it's something that actually happened to him. Case in point in Conan where he's like, and and this is the part where I grab the sword, yeah, yeah, and then I yell at the wolves. It's amazing. <laughs> That's great. It's like his autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the time that I went back into the from the future. <laughs> No, but he'll do stuff like, oh, see, she tried to punch him in the face, but he's a robot, so I can't, I can't get hurt in the face. She broke the sunglasses, though, and I think it made him kind of mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure if I've listened to, I've listened to a couple with him on it, but uh, that's fantastic. I need to listen to more because I, I bet it's good. James Cameron, I mean, I like director's commentaries because you always get a kind of a sense of like the development of a film or, you know, uh, it, for people our age group, uh, commentaries oftentimes in the early, especially in our youth, uh, served as kind of a film school uh, for those of us who were unable to like go to film school or anything like that. Um, it's It kind of serves that way. And so oh, I always um, thought Kevin, Cameron. 
Kevin, I was about to say, sorry, to, to that point, uh, Kevin Smith's commentaries taught me more about the, the, the nitty gritty of filmmaking than any class I've ever taken. I feel the same way about like Michael Mann commentaries or anything mm-hmm. like that. And like his a weird attention to detail just kind of shows like the mindset behind things. But um, yeah, I, James Cameron's one of the few that I don't love his commentaries and, and simply because like um, you've never seen a guy who literally just can't get over himself in a commentary. And it's, uh, it's a little bit disheartening in a lot of ways. It's kind of made me hate a lot of his movies more than I did before. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I love his movies and we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll get here. We'll just get this, uh, moving. But, um, I, I do suggest if you're going to uh, rewatch his movies to probably not do the director's commentaries <laughs> and just, uh, enjoy his movies for the art that they are. And, uh, try to uh, separate it from the artist cause he can certainly be an asshole. So, although for the record, he's way, way up his own ass, but the stuff he's trying to do for the environment and he puts a lot of his own money into that. kind. I mean, he's definitely respectable. He just definitely seems like a, uh, he's way up his own ass. Oh in, yeah. His focus on technology and stuff like that. And we'll get to that when we get to uh, one of my choices. I, I'll dig into that a little bit further, but why don't, why don't we start with you? I think we started with me last time. Why don't you start us off? Uh, throw him down. What is your choice for the good? Well, I'm going to go ahead and just start off shocking everybody, because for me, James Cameron's best movie is the best action movie, the funniest action movie, and truly the greatest 90s movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that is, of course, True Lies. Interesting choice, my friend. Please proceed. So, what is better than an action movie to me it's a deconstruction um it's something you know listeners may have kind of picked up about me especially if you've heard the robocop episode where i really like a good deconstruction and the thing is true lies is a deconstruction like robocop is in this sense it's funny because it uses the tropes properly and in a funny way So no point in this movie is it Naked Gun. No point is it silly. This is not a silly movie, but it is hysterically funny. Um, But at the same time, and kind of the point I'm driving at is, it's actually a really great action movie. All the one-liners, all the intrigue, the shattery secret agency with no explanation or context. We just know, you know, Harry Trasker's a spy for good old Murica. Um, because this is way more focused on the idea, and this is something I think Cameron is very, very good at, which is he takes the seed of an idea that is sort of interesting, and he takes it to this extreme that is almost beyond a logical extreme, and that is kind of why his movies work, and it's why he works so well in the genre space. So, the basic seed of an idea of... Let's explore the relationship between a spy and his wife that doesn't know he's a spy. And to take it all the way to her ending up as a spy herself and stopping, you know, the the terrorist organization and F-16 flying through a city and, you know, you're fired, one of the great all-time ending one-liners, I'm... I'm I will fight for this movie to the death. True Lies. The fact that we don't have a proper high def um, release of this movie is actually one of the greatest offenses in high def to me. That actually brings up, and you make a lot of good points um, for this film, and I agree with all of this. Um, It's You make a good point about there's not a proper high def. Um, James Cameron is weirdly hesitant to release a lot of his movies on a really good format for Blu-ray or like 4K right now. Um, and I think it's only when studios force him to, is he comfortable in doing that? So I think you're absolutely right about, it, especially the blue, the Blu-ray. Like I, it's one of those movies that's sorely missing from my Blu-ray collection. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of angers me every time I think about it. It, it sticks out, right? It, it's like weirdly missing from everyone's Blu-ray collection. <laughs> Because this seems it, like this seems like one of those movies that should have been mass produced and should be like five dollars in a Walmart bin somewhere. It should be so ubiquitous. 
Right, because it's like one of the big action movies of the 90s that, you know, like, I feel like every dad in the 90s showed their kid. They were like, here's your first rated R movie. You know, like, right? here's, here's fucking true lies, right? You, you can watch Arnold uh, uh, hit two dogs their head together to knock them both out. Yeah, so funny. It, it's great stuff, right? Um, and that, that Jamie Lee Curtis strip tease where it's like, it's sexy, but there's no nudity. So, you know, it's it's like, it's R rated, but it's a very soft R, this movie, actually. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's, it's a very soft R, which I think is why it was kind of a comfortable movie for people to show in the 90s. Uh, it was also one of those like great TV movies mm-hmm. that you didn't have to cut a lot out, but it was still like pretty enticing and stuff for like uh, an afternoon on TNT kind of deal. <laughs> so um, that's one of those great movies. I think you in this. I'm glad that you we want to talk about this first, because it's one of the things um, that kind of leads me into my pick for the good. But Uh, James Cameron is really sly at changing genres. Um, And really you could argue that this is his one comedy he's made uh, because it's a deconstruction. Um, And because of that point, it almost works as it, like you said, it's not necessarily like naked gun spoof, but as a deconstruction, it very much works as a comedy first and foremost, just using action tropes. And I think that's a really bold move for him to be like, Oh, you know me for action movies. Well, uh, I, or I know me even better and I can make a movie that kind of makes fun of all the stuff that I use. And you're like, that's kind of an interesting approach. So the one thing I'm going to throw in and it's only going to be for this episode, but Rate the Paxton in this movie. What do you think? Oh, ah. With the hair? Five stars. Oh, I completely agree. This is one of my favorite Paxtons for sure. Um, we'll, we'll get to the other ones as we get there, but um, I've, I've got a tiny dick. It's pathetic as a don't kill me line. Yeah. Maybe one of the funniest things anybody has ever said. And Bill Paxton can sell it. He can sell anything. Plus, Bill Paxton, honest, honest, I swear on my family's graves, is the best actor at swearing or using any kind of profanity. Nobody drops an F-bomb like Bill Paxton. Nobody drops any kind of swearing like Bill Paxton. Incredible stuff. That's true. You know, I'm actually... For the kind of stuff I watch and the kind of movies I like, I'm actually uh, weirdly prudish about uh certain swear words um particularly the misogynist ones personally um and even in this movie like bill paxton makes that work because he just plays the sleaziest used car salesman oh my god absolutely it's it's fantastic but yes five stars to bill paxton in this movie uh uh, both as an antagonist of sorts and uh as comedic relief in the same breath so and you know i don't want to brush by some of the slightly problematic 90s tropes used here too i mean they do have just the most generic islamic terrorists possible i mean the god what are they called the crimson jihad uh, yeah, it's it's not something that translates very well, but take it with a grain of salt. It is what it is for a 90s film. So, you know, it's it's one of those things you just have to kind of roll with and, and understand that it's an antiquated uh, way of uh, viewing things. So because uh, you do you do have to get through that to get to the wonderful lines like uh, I know what this is. It's a snow cone maker. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I'm going to use you as a human shield, then I'm going to take that dental tool there and throw it in his head. And then I was thinking I'd break your neck. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, I will say, uh, I know you usually do RT, but this is not Cameron's highest rated film. I will admit a certain personal love for this because uh, I'm seeing the meta score at least is 63. So, Yeah, it, it isn't. It's one of those movies, like I said, that I think found its um, audience later. Mm-hmm. More so than at the time, especially critically speaking. But even then, I don't think uh, the Rotten Tomato score for this is a 71. So it's not bad. It's not. It's it, still... it definitely found its audience eventually. Yep, it did. Yeah. Um, and that being said, it only has like 51 reviews or something on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's not. Also, um, Tom Arnold was in it, too. I just it has nothing to do with anything. I, I just never let it be said. I forgot that Tom Arnold was in this movie. Well, that's just an indication of the time period it fell in, which was the 90s. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because <laughs> I feel like he was in fucking everything in the 90s. And speaking of the 90s, 
frankly, your good is either going to be in the 80s or 90s. So what is it, my friend? All right. And as I said um, before, I think that this is he likes to mix genres a little bit. So I'm going to go with uh, one of his early films for my pick for the good. And I'm going to say The Terminator. That's right. The first Terminator movie Ooh. is probably my favorite James Cameron movie. I would I would make that argument. It's my favorite. Now, uh, as you you know, we brought up Rotten Tomatoes at the end of the last one. I'm going to bring this up straight. This movie has 100 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Impressive for a film that essentially launches your career um, in terms of uh, kind of your filmography. Uh, I mean, yeah, technically he had, uh, you know, a couple of movies before it, including Piranha 2, the previously mentioned Piranha 2. But The Terminator is what put him onto the onto the scene. Right. This was a movie that really, uh, as you said, the uh, technophobia in here, this uh, kind of 80s. Uh, fear of the future and a fear of the unknown about where is America going. There's a lot of layers to the Terminator that I just like, but I think in particular what I like about the Terminator more than any of his other films is that this is a movie that is a horror movie, even though it has no horror elements to it. If you replaced the Terminator with Jason Voorhees, it's a slasher, you know, it's, he's just got a gun. It's it's funny you say that because um, f- my entire life I've actually described the Terminator as a sci-fi Halloween. That is exactly what it is. It is a slasher movie with sci-fi tropes instead. That is exactly what this movie is. It's absolute, and that's what and I think. That's when not it's a great, bad thing, by the way. No, it's what it's what sets it aside, and especially as we've now had seventeen billion Terminator attempts at rebooting. Um, of which James Cameron seems to be behind quite a few of those. That's like, this is the true sequel. Um, I know, right? Yeah. Uh, for the audience out there, Sean is just making money motions. Uh, so <laughs> money, money motions. But um, Terminator 1, I think there's, even compared to his other films, and, and we'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit about this later, I like that this film is not as polished as some of his later films. It's a raw film. It feels there's a purity raw. to it. Yeah, there's a... I don't want to call there's it a, amateurish. Actually, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, th- but there's definitely a, a 80s Corman look to it. You can tell he came from the Corman space. Um, the scene where, you know, the Terminator cuts his eye out. Like, that's that's very, very much like a practical effect that you'd have expected to see in a Corman movie. Absolutely. Absolutely. I fully agree. So, and... I I think that there's a rawness to it. And I said amateurish before. I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but you can tell he's a director that's kind of finding his footing. And because of that, there's kind of this eagerness, this energy to this film where he wants to impress. You know, he's got a limited budget. He's got, um, you know, a lot of unknown stars at the time, even though Linda Hamilton and Michael Bain and, and very much Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, would become larger stars as the 80s go on. This movie kind of put them on the map. Which, so he's got a, you know, the far be it from anyone to ever talk about this movie in a podcast setting and not mention the fact that Arnold Schwarzenegger actually um, read for Kyle Reese and originally... You know who read for the Terminator? Oh, Lance Hendricks. They actually ended up uh, writing the detective role for him as a consolation prize. Yeah, yeah, and and there's yeah, there's just this kind of uh, loose feeling to this film, this loose raw feeling that I adore, and to this day, like uh, I'm sure we will do the Terminator franchise at a future date, uh, possibly post apocalypse, uh, once Judgment Day has come along, but. Um, you know, I argue that this is the best Terminator film of the franchise. I just think that its raw qualities, its genre bending effectiveness, uh, is just too good. It's too good. And immediately when you watch this movie, you're like, I see why James Cameron is able to do what he does as a director. And I think that's incredible. So that is my choice for the good is Terminator 1, The Terminator. Rock on. Rock on. So I All guess- night long. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. We forgot to rate our Paxton, which, oh. by the way, that punk hairstyle, that attitude, mm, that's at least a four-star Paxton. I'm thinking four-star Paxton. Yeah, I actually absolutely agree. Four-star Paxton. Um, he only misses a star for me because uh, he's so easily killed. Yeah. Oh, just like a fly. Yep, yep. He just gets crushed, which, I mean, 
indicates the power of the Terminator, that he could kill a Bill Paxton in such a way. But he does give the Terminator his best line. Fuck off, asshole. (laughs) <laughs> so good uh, all, all right. right well okay moving on now that we've rated our bill packs here moving we go on, what's your choice this is some for the this is some controversy for the bad ooh, you ooh, ready for I this like controversy hot to try so <laughs> allow me to finish my sentence oh oh god the abyss theatrical release so look this is the impossible choice. It is impossible to look at James Cameron's filmography and pick a bad movie unless you are one of those people who thinks it's cool to bash Avatar or you're one of those people that thinks it's cool to bash Titanic. By the way, neither of those things are cool. Um, But, like, this is one of those cases, and obviously they've always held that studio meddling didn't take place here, but studio meddling where they chopped the crap out of the finale of this movie to the point where it's almost incomprehensible unless you go back and watch the director's cut um and that is just bad doesn't make it cameron's fault necessarily but it is the worst thing with his name attached to it in my opinion another movie that has weirdly not had a great home video release no Blu-ray. Yeah. Uh, what the highest definition version of it is uh, still Laserdisc, right? Yeah. It's uh, baffling at this point. I have a, a version of it on DVD, but it is not a good version of it. And uh, there is a version that's, I believe there's a high def version that exists. Um, I actually just rewatched this film a few weeks ago. Um, and I wanted to say it was a high def version that was available on HBO because I have HBO Max because I'm one of those few people that uh, caved into that. But um, <laughs> this movie was on there for the t- at the time. I don't think it is any longer, but um, I watched it on there and I was shocked to see that I think it was a pretty high def version of it. Um, so I was kind of excited, but no home video I, release. I do understand if you catch uh, True Lies like on Cinemax there that high def versions exist. Yeah. Right. And there's some just probably rights dispute for distribution or something to that effect that's preventing it. Or or it's just James Cameron being an asshole about it. And I could see that happening. So either could be very easily. Yeah. Interesting choice, though. The Abyss. I mean, um, I agree. The theatrical cut, I I think specifying the theatrical cut is certainly uh, to this benefit because the director's cut is pretty good. The ending is fucking wild beautiful tearjerker absolutely yeah to to have kind of the alien threat of the tidal wave without the context of why they're doing it without that scene of showing kind of the cold war and then when the tidal wave reverses kind of showing that montage conclude with uh you know ed harris typing i love you in that risk computer you know without all of that like the ending's just baffling at best it's like oh the water's raising and then it's not Ooh. yeah oh for sure it's baffling and so which is why this is it's wild because on rotten tomatoes this actually has an 89 percent, and oh, that certainly. includes like reviews from the theatrical release of it so even when it was released theatrically it actually had a pretty good reputation with critics audience score it's an 83 percent and I'm arguing both the retroactive perspective of knowing the director's cut exists. Absolutely. And um, bearing in mind that I am fully caveating with it's kind of an impossible choice for me because I really love this man's filmography. <laughs> so. Oh, no, absolutely. So I, I think it's a, an interesting choice for The Abyss. I love The Abyss. Um, I love the director's cut of The Abyss, right? Uh, I'm mm-hmm. sad that I don't have it in my collection um, on any kind of a higher grade home video release but um i do agree i i also think it's kind of a wild choice for him because as i said like he likes to toy with genre and this is like his weird almost historical drama Uh, which is funny because i was gonna say it was his try to 2001 Uh, yeah that's a great that's a great i think that's a great comparison but it's more of a drama than anything else about the people on the on the ship um you know with the husband and wife or that harris and and um her name escapes me at this point um but this movie also features that because you genre bends it also features i want to point out two things uh the first thing is the idea of having mary elizabeth uh master oh god i'm not even gonna try that name i that's why i can think of her name right now i was just like uh, i don't know if i could say it 
Um, but um, the scene where they have the liquid oxygen, mm. the pink that I'm sorry, like that freaks my shit out it is so well shot that like when he they're like breathe breathe in the liquid and i'm like no don't breathe in the liquid it's fucking pink and it's weird and i can't like which uh bringing up the uh, packs and performance early his freak out at the liquid oxygen is why i definitely give this a uh three and a half star paxton absolutely three and a half the mouse i'm sorry the the, the rat or whatever yeah is, his pet I, rat it literally like breaks my heart watching that sequence. I'm like, I don't know how they did it without killing a fucking rat. Oh no, that stuff's real. I know that that's actually a real practical effect. They really did that. I know. Cause that's James Cameron's weird obsession with technology. And yeah. Like, right. Pushing that's it. true. Um, it just freaks me out every time I like fucking watch it. It freaks me out. Um, I will also agree with the Bill Paxton rating. Although I would like to add on that. There, the Michael Bain rating for this is five stars. He's he's very good in this movie. Very creepy, and like by the time he starts to lose his uh, sanity because of the depth and whatever, when they talk about that, um, he starts to lose his mind and get cabin fever or whatever the fuck it is. Um, I'm sorry, he's like an incredibly good villain. Like his weird obsession with the warhead and stuff like that. Great, great stuff there. So, uh, Bill Paxton three and a half, Michael Bain five. All right, and. With that, I won't uh, dwell on this too much because I, I don't have a lot to complain about here. I already said it all, the ending. Yeah. They they just ruined the ending. But um, how about you? What is James Cameron's worst movie? I think a lot of people are going to agree with me on this. And I'm not going to say this because I don't want to get on the bashing boat for this movie. But I am not a fan of Avatar. Um, I Interesting. I think of all of his films and, and part of this is like, yeah, I, I know James Cameron does not make claim to, to Piranha 2, the spawning Piranha 2, the spawning is a fun movie. It's like, I don't understand why he just doesn't adhere to his like roots that. Yeah. He, right. he works. It's, it's, it's an eighties jaws rip off, like all other eighties jaws rip off, rip offs. And it's you know, just, fine. just embrace your roots. And I don't know why he likes to just bash that movie all the time, but I my problem with Avatar isn't necessary. I mean, you can you get like everybody complains about it. Oh, it's Pocahontas meets Fern Goldie or whatever the fuck you want to talk about. Um, my problem with Avatar is more so that, as I mentioned before, as time has gone on, James Cameron's ego has kind of eaten up his his status or his stature on things. And I think Avatar is him exercising his ego in a way that feels disappointing to me particularly because he became so obsessed with the visuals that I do think he forgot to really think about like how this movie plays out as a movie versus as a visual effects reel. And I think for me, that's problematic. Look, every story is a remix and a retelling and James Cameron really does do kind of very basic plots a lot of james cameron's plots can be summed up very simply so my defense of avatar is like what were you really expecting because what i got was this magical world i want to live in people that connect to animals with their weird sexual organ ponytails and uh giant mechs which i think we've already established on this podcast is always going to go a long way with me (laughs) oh for sure for sure and what's funny is i can see why people like this movie it's beautiful it's a beautiful movie right um it's a gorgeous movie and you're right like it's a pretty basic plot and i'm okay with that um you've heard me say it a thousand times i'll say it a thousand times more originality is overrated right Mm -hmm. it's the execution of the that makes things feel original right nothing is fucking original hasn't been for hundreds of fucking years prime example dread and the raid came out at the same time and they are basically the same plot and yet two entirely different and separately wonderful movies yeah absolutely i think my problem with this is in the execution i just um as much as it's a beautiful film i don't think like particularly by the time that this came out motion capture was getting pretty good in terms of like performances and I don't know if James Cameron knew how to bring out a good performance in motion capture. So you hate Giovanni Ribisi. That's what I'm hearing. I uh, love Giovanni Ribisi. (laughs) I actually weirdly hate Sigourney Weaver in this movie. Not her best role. I love her. And I think she's 
not the best. I do not like Sam Worthington in any movie. No, he's so terrible. I think he's a problem in this, especially in a lead. But on the counterpoint, Zoe Saldana and that character, wonderful. Zoe Saldana, fantastic. Stephen Lang, fantastic. Stephen villain. Lang is awesome in the movie. Um, no obvious Paxton, too bad. But um, no, no. So Paxton rating zero. For this movie, yeah, automatically makes this the worst film. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I weirdly enough, I think if you're gonna write, if you're gonna make a simple movie, make it simple, right? This movie weirdly tries to layer upon layer on a simple story, and I think it gets lost in the layers on it, where it's like, because uh, it is a simple story, and then he tries to build it up, build it up, build it up, and it doesn't work for me to to the point that this motherfucker's 162 minutes. It is a long movie, even for Cameron. It's a long movie. This does not need to be 162 minutes. No, I, I'll I, give you that. I am a, I'm a firm believer. I will give any movie. I don't care what the fuck movie it is. I will give any movie 90 minutes. You get 90 minutes of my time, no matter what you are. For every 15 minutes after that, you have to fucking earn it. And this movie does not earn it for me. And I just think, mm. I don't necessarily think it's a bad movie. I'm not going to jump on the bashing thing. I do think there's good things about it. Does it deserve four sequels already? <laughs> Not so sure about that. But um, let's see how one sequel does. Let's see how one sequel goes. Right. Yeah. Particularly with that, you know, but I, I feel like this is a movie that could, this is a movie and, and I, I was making a joke that we haven't really talked about Quentin Tarantino before. Um, I'm going to make a Quentin Tarantino reference here because this, this movie suffers from the same problem that Quentin Tarantino has. And that is the studio was not willing to tell him no on any part of this. They were willing to shovel money at him. And obviously for good reason, this movie is still a massive money maker. Um, it's still number two in the all time box office of all time, fucking whatever you want. Um, mm-hmm. I just do, I don't, I don't see it here. I don't see why it deserved to be that. And while it's a fine movie, fine in James Cameron's filmography doesn't cut it. All right. Well, I uh, don't necessarily agree, but that is not the point of the segment. Is That's it? why we debate this. Uh, 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 uh. So, okay. Um, so now, now we have to go into the weird. Oh, no, actually, I do want to say it is kind of weird, though, that the biggest actual push we've had in the course of this show so far of all goddamn movies is Avatar. Like in, in terms of disagreement? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. A- I don't know. You did talk shit about Insidious. That is a really bad movie. See, and I think that's a really good movie. <laughs> and so uh, we'll just have to. I think Insidious might be the biggest disparity we have between. Hate well, considering life. I made it my bad. Yeah, no kidding. Fair yeah, point. yeah. And I was arguing, I almost put it for my good. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Okay. Uh, yeah. so, so that sorry, one might be yes. our basic. Avatar, close second. Just like so, in terms of the worldwide box office. Close what, second. What is my weird? And this is one of those things where you can justify it a couple of different ways. So what I'm going with personally is Aliens. And the reason I'm choosing that for weird specifically is because you went and you took a super isolated horror movie where it was one creature taking them, taking out people um, on a well-designed isolated ship and you open it way up and you're on a whole world now and you make it ostensibly a horror action movie. And you, you don't even just like double the enemies. Like it's a swarm of the creatures from the first movie and yet it works. And some people even argue it is the better of the two movies. If that isn't the definition of weird, because weird can be good. I don't know what is. I can't disagree with you. Now I would argue that alien is better than aliens. And I'm sure we'll get to that once we do a new franchise fatigue on Alien. Whenever we decide to uh, really <laughs> hash out something that's been hashed out a thousand times, I think that that's one to, to save for later. But um, I do think that Aliens is a is a weird film. It's a weird because it, I think you're movie, right. Opening it up. I mean, the tagline. Look at the tagline. 
this is war. This time it's war, right? Like yeah. they, they straight out were like, fuck it. We're going to, we're going to just full in embrace this. Um, I do. I do love aliens. It's one of the greatest action movies ever made. Hands down period. Um, before I even get into listing why I love this movie, which I mean, almost masturbatory at this point, it really is one of the greatest action movies ever made. But let's just jump straight into the Paxton rating, which on this one I'm going to give six out of five stars because this is his Game Over Man is like the defining Paxton breakdown. I absolutely. Um, it's an incredible. The Pat, yeah, Paxton, six out of five stars. Uh, I agree. I, w- I, w- I think I might only give it five out of five. I'm sorry. I don't know. I just can't break the rules on that. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, everybody, you, you always want to talk about game over, but there's also, you know, how can I get out of this chicken shit outfit? Yeah. Oh, or, for you sure. know, Vasquez, anyone ever confused you for a man? Yeah. Uh, and his freak out moment when, um, Bishop, fucking does the knife thing over his hand (laughs) oh that face he makes the the face he makes incredible stuff yes five out of five stars for the for the bill paxton in this movie um it is a fantastic one um you know so but on a on a strict level and obviously we can get into this if we ever do the full alien franchise but on a kind of minor level so alien is a movie in and of itself, that has some deep themes about, um, you know, sexuality, sexual assault, fear thereof, isolation, a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, fear of technology is actually a big thing there, which I'm sure is yeah. what perked Cameron up to it. But um, to take that and kind of ensue all of it for themes of motherhood um, instead and pitting two mothers against each other is such an interesting weird way to go with it but it's an interesting one because you go from uh i mean like literally the it's it's a well-known factor that sexual assault is the thematic horror of the movie alien and to go from that to very clearly themes of motherhood um with uh you know sigourney weaver's own daughter being older than her and then um kind of taking on newt and fighting the alien queen which is in very literal way as far as we knew especially at this point when this came out the mother for the whole race for all we knew yeah um it's it's just kind of an interesting but weird way to go with it and i i think it's wonderful get away from her you bitch all day oh absolutely i'm sorry the the forklift loader mech Mm. is uh, speaking of my giant robots yeah no joke i know Right, which he, like, weirdly distinctly rips off himself in Avatar. (laughs) I know. They do. They are absolutely power loaders. That's pretty funny. Yeah, absolutely for that. So, I agree. Um, 97% on Rotten Tomatoes for Aliens. That's, uh, you can't go wrong with Aliens. It's a great, Mm -mm. great choice. So, that's uh, a good one. I I applaud. All right. And how about you? How did you define weird for this? Uh, you know what? For weird, uh, you already since we only have eight films in his filmography, and neither of us are already talking about Titanic. We already mentioned that. Uh, you guys can pretty much guess what my weird choice is probably going to be. Uh, mm. It is your choice for the good, and that is True, True Lies. Lies. So we've already kind of discussed this. Uh, I did want to say one point that I want to ask you about True Lies because this is your choice for the good. We already talked about that this is a comedy. I think that that's what kind of makes it weird is he uh, deconstructed his own style for this movie. I think that's a kind of a weird choice for him, but very bold and very good. Mm-hmm. I want to... Uh, pick your brain about uh, why the fuck haven't we gotten True Lies 2? Boy, now that is a great, great question. Um, Because I would certainly be down to have the gang get back together. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Schwarzenegger back. Boris and Doris. (laughs) Get, Get Tom Arnold in the van. Why am I always in the van? Hell, let Tom Arnold dance this time. Yeah, let him let him dance. No, um, um, that's a that's actually a really really good question because it wasn't a critical success, but I recall it being a reasonable financial one. And by God, every action movie got a sequel in those days, and there's plenty to do. Harry Trasker, by his very nature, worked for like a shadowy spy organization nominally for the United States. Like, yeah, the 
there's I can't think of a single reason they didn't sequel it. Yeah, it's it's a very strange idea. And what's funny is like, even though I mean he talks about a true life sequel occasionally on and off, uh, doing that now now he states that the only he can say every story he wants to do in the Avatar universe, which is why he wants to do four more of those, um, which is a very strange and weirdly boxed in viewpoint for a gentleman who's generally been thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. But um, I would, I'd be game for true lies to now with Arnold and Jamie. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis is now getting a little bit of a mainstream kickback with the new Halloween movie uh, and the upcoming sequels to that. And I, she's still in a fantastic actress. I, Arnold oh. is still doing his things. But come on, tell me about a family. Like, let's God, talk about actually, their kids. Come you know, on. Image that just popped into my head as soon as he started talking about that, too, is, uh, you know, you got Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of as the command role now, and he's the dude with the eye patch. But he's kind of in that Charlton Heston leader role and then you've got like uh jamie lee curtis and elijah dushku uh-huh yeah uh-huh. that was her first movie too um like uh you know overthrowing like a small south american country or something you know you give it just that good old-fashioned cia yeah i think you can make this work i think it would be fun and you can you can do the whole family thing again if you wanted to versus the marriage thing you could do like they were keeping it a, a secret from their kids or their grandkids or whatever you wanted to do. It would be fun to do grandkids. That'd be like, mm. my grandparents are fucking CIA. Um, partially because it's a deconstruction on action movies to begin with. Like you can literally do a, a, a deconstruction of the meta action film where you have like the generational thing. I think it's true. Realize two would be good. I, what's funny is I've always had this on my short list for franchise, but not fatigue. Uh, I guess we just kind of <laughs> ruined that, but um, you know, I do think that I just wanted to bring that up because it is, uh, we've already kind of discussed it, but I think a sequel would is well needed. And even if James Cameron doesn't do it, I would be okay for it. So yeah, let Robert Rodriguez do it. He did fine with Alita. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you much. There was, All right. there was some definite Rodriguez weirdness with Alita, but you know what? That movie was fine. I, you know what? I, I, I come on fucking rocket hammer, rocket hammer, rocket hammer. Am I right? rocket yeah. hammer, <laughs> rocket <laughs> hammer. Now we just need a combination of Alita battle angel and Jupiter ascending. We just need mm. to make them one universe so that we could have a Wolfman and rocket boots with a rocket hammer. That's all I want in my life. That would be God pretty metal. Damn it. <laughs> but obviously we can't and have I'm a jupiter spent. can't have a jupiter ascending sequel uh sean bean survived the movie yeah yeah and his I, franchise I, is cursed that's that's a movie we should we should talk about the wachowski someday oh dude you you think i'm uh you think i'm a cameron stan so far hear me defend every movie of the wachowskis and the good <laughs> will shock you uh, oh that's going on the short list all right wachowskis in the future <laughs> you guys know it's coming all right moving on last category wild sean what is your pick okay so look y'all i am not even gonna try in front like of course i'm gonna use my wild card pick to talk about terminator 2 this movie was so defining to my childhood I don't even, I mean, it, it's on par with RoboCop. As a matter of fact, when they did RoboCop versus Terminator, Sean's, what was I, 12-year-old mind exploded. Um, Like, some of my earliest memories were getting together with friends and watching Terminator 2 on a tape pirated vhs copy where they recorded over a whole chunk of the bar scene at the beginning you know it's that sort of memories of it and um i remember buying a vhs copy of this from the library when they were turning out like old stuff for a quarter and it was didn't even have a cover it was literally just the tape and i watched that thing till it snapped um i mean i've i think i've this may be the only movie i have bought every version that has ever come out actually <laughs> every version every uh, single one the new 4k looks fantastic on oh it, it's so good and um i'm also a big defender of the director's cut but not the alternative cut and if you don't know the difference the alternative cut has the really bad stupid ending in a playground yeah yeah 
Yeah, that's the a... director's cut just has a delightful scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger tries to smile and it's hilarious. Oh yeah, the smiling scene is great. Um, that's so good. It's one good, of my right? favorite gifts. So to send to people, uh, the smiling <laughs> scene from this. A ninety-three percent on Rotten Tomatoes for Terminator Two. So weirdly enough, lower than the first Terminator. So although um, you know you're talking about your genre bending, I mean this movie works literally equally well as a thriller, a drama, and I mean like a very serious time travel drama. And as a uh, as an action movie and a very kick ass one, there may be slicker choreography and there may be better air quote fight scenes in movies, but name me a single more brutal hit in all of filmography than Linda Hamilton baseball swing in that uh, mop handle into that dude's face during the escape scene. Helicopter wreck. That's all I got to oh. say. Oh the my the God. best stunt is wrecking that helicopter into the back of a van. That fucking looks real. Incredible uh, even action. Flying the helicopter under an overpass, which, by the way, he really did. Yeah. Like, that and, was a practical stunt. Or the motorcycle jumping in front of the helicopter with guy jumping mm. off a motorcycle. And I mean, the stunt work in this, I, I mean, I don't think you're wrong to say that this movie really did kind of up the ante in the 90s. Um, in terms of stunt work and action movies people think of it as such a heavy computer effects movie you know there's like 10 computer shots in the entire film it's almost entirely practical yeah it's incredible stuff i mean he was obsessed with the computer effects and wanting to get it right and using the mirror what he made the abyss for the abyss was literally a tech demo for terminator 2 yeah it's um incredible stuff here but uh, i agree terminator 2 is a movie i saw in theaters i distinctly remember seeing in theaters and being like excited because we grew up watching terminator and like as a family we were like we're going to see terminator 2 you know (laughs) and um i i distinctly remember seeing this in theaters and being like just jaw dropping and uh trying to um with my bb gun uh you know or my brother's bb gun he had a little bb gun um uh, where i grew up trying to do the uh the the cocking motion on when he's on the motorcycle trying to do that about probably you know almost shooting my own eye out and things like that Um, (laughs) i wouldn't put it past me but um i mean this movie was super influential for me um also i think it's a big part i think in terms of the history of cinema this might be his most impactful movie outside of maybe avatar just for this box office sake um, this might be his most impactful movie on the history of cinema, just simply because of how far it pushed the blockbuster up in the I early mean, '90s. You and I are uh, you and I are weird guys who make weird choices for this stuff, but traditionally, the Cameron argument would be Aliens or Terminator Two. Traditionally, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I think Terminator Two more so even the, so than Aliens um, in terms of just pushing the envelope to the next level, and part of that was the the strong use of CGI and then the incredible stunt work. Uh, and then him just coming back and being like, yeah, you know what? I'm coming. You remember that movie I did fucking 10 years ago? I'm making a sequel to it and it's going to be bigger, and badder and bolder. By the way, um, you, we want to talk about character transformations. <sighs> Sarah Connor from part one to part two. Mm. That first scene where, you know, Silverman's walking by and she's just doing the chin ups is everything you need to know about that character. And that is visual storytelling. Yeah. Everything you need to know about what Sarah Connor has been up to is her in prison doing (laughs) pull-ups. It's also the same transformation she went through in real life by being married to James Cameron. Mm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And by the way, name me one kid in the era who saw that movie who didn't want that little pocket Apple pin pad to try oh. and hack ATM machines. I, oh, absolutely. I wish that worked like that. Yeah, no Easy shit. Easy money. Um, I, once I made that joke about Linda Hamilton's marriage to, to uh, James Cameron, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she actually married him after this movie. I think right after this movie, yeah. Yeah, yeah, now that I think about uh, it. Was he uh, still married to Catherine Bigelow at this point? I think so. I think he was. Yep, so. Um, so my joke kind of falls flat there, but uh, I still stand by it. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's nothing that'll, uh, uh, destroy a marriage faster than just being married to James Cameron. (laughs) Boy, God, that's true. Oh shit. (laughs) All right. Terminator 2. Both Catherine Bigelow and (laughs) Linda Hamilton. (laughs) All right. Okay. 
My wild. Yeah, um, what is your wild? You've already we've already talked about it, so we'll just briefly go through this. My wild is aliens. Mm. Um for the same reason you put it for weird, uh essentially that the idea that taking a intimate atmospheric driven horror film uh and then turning it into a full-on action sci-fi romp is uh kind of fucking incredible it's a it's a wild left turn that works in a lot of ways uh it fully embraces ellen ripley as an action heroine and Mm -hmm. god bless him i was just having this discussion with my family the other day that how hollywood is weirdly behind uh the times on on really giving action heroines uh their own films and franchises that isn't based on previous ip I know um, you see those obnoxious memes going around where it's like, who needs strong women? Look, we had Sarah Connor in the eighties and I'm like, yeah, cause you can come up with three examples. That's literally the freaking problem. Yeah. It's yeah. There's only three examples, right? And Ellen Ripley's one of them is one of the she prime examples. Is. And, and he really and does. She is a badass and no one is taking that away from her. It's, it's the, the problem was the lack of. Yeah. And, and I was making the argument that, you know, that there's a, especially in Asian cinema that the female heroine has has been a part since the 1960s. And in the U S uh, you know, maybe future time episode uh, person, Pam Greer was kind of the big one here in the U S prior to the eighties. And even through the eighties, he didn't get a lot. So uh, it was kind of a sad state of affairs. It still is in terms mm-hmm. of having a true, Uh, action heroines uh but ellen ripley incredible one here uh five out of five stars for ellen ripley Uh, i also wanted to give a michael bain rating for this one five out of five stars he's Uh, very very good some michael bain here it's uh hicks right yeah damn right it's hicks um Mm -hmm. incredible oh my god who's the uh who's the commander i know he's only in it for a second but uh you know i've got my eye on you oh um oh shit i can't think of his name i love that guy yeah this is, yeah. but it's full of, it's full of, I mean, actually Cameron's entire rogues gallery is in here. Cause even the lady that plays Vasquez is the uh, stepmom from Terminator two. Absolutely. Yeah. No, he, James Cameron likes to reuse people over and over again. Um, and things like that. So, uh, uh, Al Matthews was a pwn. There you go. That's it. Um, that, but also, that is. yeah, no, it's, uh, um, my earliest Lance Hendrickson memory, even though as time's gone on, I've grown into much more of a pumpkin hand fanboy. Boy, we should shortlist that one for NFF. Ooh, um, yeah, we should. Yes, please. <laughs> but, uh, but like in a career just full of awesome, amazing character roles, like Bishop is memorable. Like that is an all timer character i love bishop yeah um not bad yeah. for a human i mean oh oh he's so good he's so good in this too so uh, but yeah so that's my choice for uh wild card is aliens simply because it's kind of an interesting spin on things i do think it's one of his best films uh as you mentioned one of the action movies that kind of defines sci-fi action for a long long time so i uh, gotta give it to him for that so I don't know. Anything we missed? Uh, I don't know. Listeners out there, is there something we missed that we didn't talk about you wanted to talk about? Uh, are you, hit us up. Are you just furious we didn't? I, I know Matt brought up Piranha 2, but should we have talked more about Piranha 2? Uh, James Cameron would say no. We should completely forget it exists, even though it got this beautiful Scream Factory release on Blu-ray. <laughs> He only had eight films, so and and I even got in my Alita Battle Angel shit. If we'd gone with him as a writer, it'd be a little different, admittedly. Or a producer, even more so. We could have uh, talked a lot more about things. Um, I I just don't. Him as a writer is a really interesting thing because I don't think he's nearly as good as a writer as he is a director. But yeah, I'm seeing a lot of shorts, but it doesn't really look like we missed any of his movies. Are you? Should we have talked about Titanic? Do you have some incredible theory that makes it genre cult film? Was it aliens? Yeah. Was, was it the iceberg aliens? I think the iceberg was Godzilla. Oh, mm. you know what? I'm going to be honest. That's a movie I'd watch. I Titanic watch versus Godzilla. Only if the Titanic turns into a giant mech. 
Uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, you know, if you wanted to let, let us know if you have a pick for the category, head over to our social media, chime in. You can find us over at Facebook at facebook.com. No franchise fatigue or over at Twitter at NFF pod. Uh, where can our listeners find you, Sean? They can also find, you can email me at any time. Tell me how much you absolutely love, uh, the abyss and how wrong I am at nffpod.sean at gmail.com my name is as always a four letter word yeah yeah you can also find me over at nffpod dot uh, abyss theatrical cut for life uh, <laughs> at gmail.com that's where you can find me uh, you can also find me over at twitter at the movie mat so please uh, let us know uh, also throw in your thoughts who should we cover next on um, good, bad, weird, wild. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. We uh, are taking in any kind of recommendations. God knows uh, for NFF, we have definitely gotten a lot of re- recommendations for Phantasm now, which I feel like we kind of have to do. So many requests for Phantasm you know, at this point. Just saying, we've gotten an awful lot of requests for Puppet Master. Ah, oh, God, you're going to make me do Puppet Master, and I'm going to be so angry. Because that'll that will literally take six months for us to do. <laughs> we will um, be watching Puppet Master movies till we fucking die. Although on that front, we are due for another Ring episode, actually. Yeah, we do have to finish our Ring one up, so that'll probably be uh, part of uh, uh, next season. Next season, we will do finish up our Ring uh, to finish up that large franchise, and then maybe we'll start a new larger franchise. Uh, let us know what franchises do you want to see. Uh, check out our uh, other episodes of No Franchise Fatigue, and along with uh, Fatigued but Not Forgotten, uh, we're out every week. We got weekly episodes, so check us out. Uh, you know what? And remember, uh, next time we'll be back. We'll be back, Sean. <laughs> I'll be back. How many bad yeah, Arnold yeah, yeah. impersonations are you going to have to cut out of this episode? At least 100. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> have a good night. I'll be back. <laughs>